Hello, welcome to the second part of the Once a Blue episode four uh, of the Arsenal special. Um, in this one, we'll be talking about Colo Torre and Sami and Nasri. If you did. So, who should we start off with? Torre or Nasri? Which, which one's your favourite? Well, Torre for me will probably be a little bit quicker than Nasri. So, let's go with Torre. Go with Torre. Okay, okay. So, obviously. Before we get into when he signed and what he did, he and his brother are probably known mostly for the world's most famous song out there, really. That there's no getting past the ya ya, colo colo, is there? I mean, my <laughs> wife sings it. My, my wife sings it to our little boy to get him to sleep, for Christ's sake. That's how famous it is. <laughs> and, and that's the great thing as well. Every club who ya ya or colo have played for sing that song so you go up to glasgow celtic they sing it there over in greece you know yaya tori had that little stint with olympiakos they sing it there you know they sing it you know liverpool because colo you know played there for a little while i just think this song has just kind of taken on a life of its own it's it it, it real funny if you look at some of those videos of you know city fans celebrating after we won the league 2012 that's the big song that mo- most of the fans are singing is the Colo uh, uh, Yaya one. I, f- I find it hilarious. Yeah, I love them sort of cult figures, though, especially when they bag out a song as well. I mean, Dan Halifax doesn't want to shy away. He's sung it plenty of times when he's had a few down the pub as well. So as long as we've got people like him singing the heart out as well. Um, but yeah, back to it. He was obviously uh, from the Ivory Coast. Uh, he was mainly a centre-back. I know he'd like to get forward in his younger years for Arsenal. Uh, we signed him on the 28th of July in 2009 for a reported fee of 14 million, which again that that, that was nothing for the calibre of play we we were signing. Um, as soon as he came in, Mark Hughes appointed him club captain, uh, which in my eyes he did well. You know, as a club captain, this was obviously prior to the Tevez and company era, and you know, Dunn was a bit. In and out of uh, out, out of everything, so we, we needed a, a solid being there, done that player. Obviously, we were going to try and challenge for trophies. We needed a, a an experience. Going back to the experience side of it, we needed an experienced person to do it. And by all rights, I think it was the right choice. Um, his first goal, would you believe, uh, came in a two-one win against Fulham in the League Cup, um, and. Well, basically, that, that, that was only the highlights for his first season. In 2010-2011 season, um, Mancini, obviously around that point, gave the captain's armband to Carlos Tevez, which was reported that he'd actually had a bust-up with Torre uh, in terms of giving the armband to Tevez. Torre thought he still deserved it after everything he'd done in the pre- previous year. Um, and he, he was outrightly refusing to give it to him. Um, th- these are countless reports, by the way. Th- this isn't 100% fact. This is, I've read reports, obviously, I do my research, and it was most of it was going down to uh, the bust up. Um, and yeah, it, it was uh, given to Tevez at the time. Um, March the 3rd in 2011. Can you remember what happened to Torre, which sort of the that downward was- spiral? death knell of his career that was the uh missing the drugs test wasn't it that was the one yeah, yeah from which he was uh, banned for six months yeah which this was a six recall this was the whole it was diet pills that it was yeah it was taking had some stimulant in them or something like that and that's that's what was showing up but yeah he was a big lad wasn't he and that's kind of what he was saying that I wasn't doing anything or he didn't think he was doing anything wrong but he was just trying to keep himself fit and you know, keep keep any of that weight off because he was a professional football player. But yeah, you're right, Dan. That was basically the beginning and the end for him at City. So, what 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 are your uh, what are your fond memories of Colo? Are there any uh, by the song, obviously? So, Colo for me definitely is that one who I was talking about with uh, with Sagna on a, a previous podcast that we did. He was definitely a player where, for me, Arsenal saw the the, the better player than, than we did. Yeah. So 
Um, I think it was Mark Hughes who, who signed Colo, and I think Mark Hughes recognised that we needed a little bit more leadership, not only at the back, but maybe just at the club as, as, as a whole. Um, you know, think that Vincent Company was really just only emerging then as the, you know, as that central defensive rock. Um, so we we needed someone like Colo there, and I but I just think if you seem to remember, Colo was basically playing centre back for a very very good Arsenal team. I think he was 22 when he cemented that place in the first team. Uh, an incredibly good player, and I think. For four or five years uh, at Arsenal, he was one of the best central defenders, not only in the Premier League, but but in Europe. And I think Mark Hughes wanted that. I just think, unfortunately, we probably didn't see the best Colo Torre that, that, that Arsenal did. Not to say that he didn't do a bad job for us. I was just looking at his stats here. You know, we played 35 games the first season. Uh, and that probably goes back to your point as well, Dan, that, you know, I think maybe he felt a little bit more wanted when, when he arrived because that's when he played 35 games. He was captain, scored two goals. Uh, and then he was, and th this is the interesting thing, the following season, 29 games. Season after that, 11-12, where we won the Premier League, just 20 games. And then 12-13, just 18 games. So I think you can see the change of manager. Vincent Company stepped up to the plate. Jolie and Lescott became you know, the partner for Vincent Company and, and it went like this for Colo. And, you know, and let's be honest, he was totally outshone by his brother, you yeah. know, who, who joined and, you know, who, who and his brother was really one of the best players Manchester City have ever, ever, ever had at the club. So, and that's, I'm sure he enjoyed it because they seem to have a very close relationship. But, you know, I've got a big brother, you know, as well, you've got a brother as well, Dan, right? That, uh, you'd yeah, be a bit... I've got a younger and brother, older. <laughs> you'd be a bit pissed off, wouldn't you? You know, they come to your club and then they, they're they not hogging all the glory, but you're just like, God, you know, he won the game for them on Saturday and, you know, whatever else. And I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I met Colo Torre when he came out here to do the um, to do the preseason training. And I love, couldn't have met a nicer bloke, really nice guy. And I think this is why he's having such a good career after his footballing, you know, is over. I know he went to play for Liverpool and Celtic after us, but he seems to have really got into the coaching side of thing. And I think that's because not only was he a good player, worked with some very good coaches at Arsenal, at Manchester City and, you know, Liverpool, etc. But, you know, I have a lot of time for Brendan Rodgers. I think he's a very, very, very good coach. And when he's looking at Colo Torre and think, you know, this guy can do a job for us. It's no surprise to me that Colo's followed him uh, into that uh, coaching side. But yeah, just I would sum it up by saying we didn't get the Arsenal player at Manchester City. And he, yes, a bit more of a backery Sagner did a job for us, but he joined at a time where we were getting some of the best players in the world coming to join us. And he was gonna, he was always going to be an understudy. Yeah, for me, what what I see of Colo, he was that. That ninth point of the transition between being the club that we were from the takeover to the FA yep. Cup to the title winning team. He was that player that was allowed us to sit back and have our board, our club, think about the signings to improve the squad from which we went on to sign Lescott, from which we went on to bring Vinny into the, into the ranks, which he gave Zabaleta a lot more time to improve. Uh, Kolarov and Kalisha were able to perform a bit better. You know, he, he just, he was solid. That, that's all I can say about him. He, I remember the odd couple of games where he was not dreadful, but didn't live up to the hype he did at Arsenal. Completely agree. Arsenal saw the complete bear of the years. I mean, he has one yeah. hell of a record for Arsenal. Um, but, you know, he, he was part of the team, you know, he won an FA Cup with us. So I, I, I go back to what I said about Kalishi, he was part of a team that won something and that's all we can ask of a player. You know, he, he liked playing for us. He, he, other than obviously what happened with the drug ban, he, he never really had a problem with us, did he? He never really had a problem with City, he just got onto the pitch, did his job. If he wasn't playing, he didn't complain and go back to your point. Yeah, yeah, I was hogging up most of the glory from winning games. He didn't mind. 
he, he, just, he was just a professional. That's the best way to describe him. And again, he, he won his trophies. So I have nothing but pride for him. Exactly. Um, yeah. But before he left uh, for Liverpool in 2013, yeah, he made a total appearance of 102 appearances, scoring a total of three goals. Uh, and his honours include two Premier League titles, two FA Cups, and three Community Shields. Uh, he's got he's got some pedigree behind him as well, which backs up the performances. And I mean, if you're speaking to any young kid who wants to know about the era of the Arsenal Invincibles, you know, the beginning of the City dynasty, just just the the, the 2000s to 2010 era. Colo Torre is one of the main centre backs you talk about. In a, if you want to look at proper centre back, he, he's one you refer him to. And again, he's a professional. Can't ask more from a player. Well, easy, great player. Just we just maybe didn't, you know, he wasn't our Vincent Company basically, and you know, and I think at Arsenal he probably was. He was one of their best ever. They've always been blessed, you know, up until recently with very very good central defenders. Certainly for the last 20, 30 years, they're struggling now. But again, you know, if you ask Arsenal fans like we were talking about before, you know, if you said to them, hey, would you like a 22-year-old Colo Torre back, uh, you know, right now, I bet they'd snap your hand off. Yeah, without a doubt. I'm glad you uh, you stopped yourself when you said uh, Arsenal being blessed with some fantastic centre-backs and everything that happened on Wednesday night. I'm glad you, I'm glad you said up until now. <laughs> Putting Colo Torre in the same category as David Luiz would have been the downfall of your Manchester in blue career. <laughs> I think what Tony Adams is probably what about sixty now. I bet you could put an Arsenal shirt on him and he would be playing <laughs> better than Ben's at the moment. <laughs> right. Well, moving on from Colo Torre, uh, we'll be going to a Frenchman who I believe played with him. Well, I believe I know he played with him. I don't know why I said I believe. Uh, another Frenchman, obviously, in Samia Nasri. Uh, we all know Sami and Nasri. I'd, I'd go as far to say Sami and Nasri underachieved at City, and this would probably be an unpopular opinion a lot at City. I don't think he lived anywhere near to the potential that man had when he signed for us. I mean, he was 24 I, years of age, I think, when he signed yeah, for us. I uh, Damn. Yeah, he, 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 he just. I don't know. He had snippets. His first season was fantastic for my in my eyes. Um, but yeah, he signed for us in 2011 on the 24th of August for a reported fee of 25 million. Um, which, from what he was doing at Arsenal at the time, like I said, I think he was what, 23, 24 at the time. Yeah, he he was young still. And that was off that incredible season he had at Arsenal, right? When we yeah. signed him, he, wasn't he like only second top scorer behind Van Persie or something that season? Yeah. He was just yeah, yeah. He was phenomenal. I always, Arsenal that goal. Do you remember he scored? It was kind of in the goal mouth. And he kind of took it round somehow about seven players, you know, mm. in the six yard box and, and, and banged it in and was looking like, bloody hell, where where have you been? That is just absolutely mm. incredible. Yeah. And I mean, of course, he's now with uh, Vincent at uh, Anderlecht. So yeah. uh, you know, fair play to him. But uh, yeah, he made his uh, debut. Uh, against Spurs, the Ed and Dzeko show, which, can you remember how many assists he made on his debut that day? Um, it's not a trick I'm question. Gonna, I'm going to say three. Hang on. That trick of assists on his debut. The, the, that, that, that should have been the start of something special for Nasri. You know, yeah. it, it, that, that was a debut for crying out loud. You know, you, you can't get much better if you're an attacking midfielder other than scoring three goals. Um, oh. and, and he just hit the ground running. And uh, obviously his first goal was against Blackburn um, a few days later after that game. Um, he did have his fair few say, controversies with Mancini. Mancini wasn't the biggest fan despite signing him. And Mancini was quoted once saying he would like to give Nazari a punch due to the inconsistent form of his City career under him. Because, and I mean, I, I agree with Mancini. Nazari, he had the potential to be one of the best attacking midfielders in the world on a consistent level. Yeah. He was never, ever, ever, ever consistent enough for me. 
we, we saw snippets such as the Spurs game with a hat trick. A couple of games down the line, it was non existent. Um, and yeah, I, I, for Mancini to say that, I, I can't, much as I don't contone violence, I don't I, I agree with it in some sense. Uh, yeah. But yeah, what what are your what are your memories of Nasri? I mean, everything you said, Dan, I just completely agree with with Nasri. That I remember him being on the radar when he was seventeen, eighteen, uh, when he played for Marseille, and you started reading reports that basically the news in it in Zidane is is here. Like he he was talked about in that breath that that's how good he was, and I I remember. At one stage, I think it was when Stuart Pearce was manager, that we were trying to get Nasri. I think we were getting him on like on a season-long loan or something like that, uh, with a view to a permanent deal. I seem to remember it kind of being pretty close to going through, and it obviously never happened in the end. Stayed at Marseille, went to Arsenal, um, but I'm um, I'm in complete agreement with you that what we thought we were signing or what we were hoping we were signing was the Nasri who had that incredible season at, at Arsenal the season before. And we didn't get that. What we got is a player that on his day was absolutely impl- unplayable and was basically like Zinedine Zidane and was just fantastic. Unfortunately, he did that one in four games. Yeah. Uh, and... Scored some great goals for us. Um, you know, my big memories there are the winner he scored against Chelsea. That was um, one I was going to bring up, yeah. Tevez back heel. Uh, that was brilliant. Uh, and that goal, for me, that League Cup final against Sunderland, mm. Torre takes all the plaudits for that, for that goal that he scored. I think Nasri's was a better goal. Yeah. I, I and um, bend it round and get it and, and get it in the goal. There's not many players down in the world who could do that. And I think it's frustration with Nasri that we were kind of hoping that we were going to see that week in, week out. And I think he had it in him. If he really wanted to, he could have done it. Yeah. And he and he didn't want. He played like that in Arsenal in his last season and he got his move that he wanted. And then it was, I kind of just got this feeling that he got his big move on a massive contract at City, surrounded by great players. All right, I'm done now. You know, what do I need to do? Um, all I can say in his defence with that is Vincent Company obviously saw something in Nasri in the, in the years that he was at Manchester City. Because if Vincent Company is going to take Nasri, an older Nasri, over to Anderlecht, you must think that he can do a can do a job for him. But yeah, I think that's the golden word, Dan, with Nasri. It's underachieved. Yeah. Snippets of brilliance, and then just an average Gundawan midfielder. You know, at, at other stages of his City career, and it's a bit disappointing, really. Uh, yeah. But. God, he, he won plenty of trophies when he was with us, so hopefully he, he, he hopefully he enjoyed his time with us. Yeah, I mean, I thought the only problem with Nasri I've got is his inconsistency. I, I thought he, he, he wasn't a selfish player. I know there was that time when there was the contract talk stalling because he wanted more money. Hey, what player doesn't want more money at some point in their careers? You know, especially when you're playing for a billionaire owners such as Man City. But, he, you know... I, I, I think the desire in the heart to play 100% was there from him. I just don't think he, not necessarily, necessarily lacked confidence, just didn't believe in himself enough that the hype around him could be achieved by him. He had it in him, you know, and he, he just never, never, never achieved it. Um, and of course, the, the downward spiral of his City career was in 2015 um, when Manuel Pellegrini. Um, was in a press conference and said Nasri was going to be out for up to five months uh, due to a tendon injury, um, which he, he, he never, I wouldn't say recovered from, he never refound that form that he had. Oh. Um, and of course, it resulted to him being learned to Sevilla uh, for, uh, for the season. Um, yeah, and w- w- when he came back, he... he he wasn't part of the plans anymore and he made a, uh, a permanent move to Turkish side 
never remember how to pronounce his name. And and talent, Atan yeah, and Talaspor. Yeah, Spore, That's the one. And uh, he only went for three point five million euros. So we still got some money out of him, but I, I, I think that was kind of generous from the Turkish team, considering how much his career had just dipped because of that injury. He never really recovered. I mean, that was a tendon injury. Yeah. You know, it, 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 it's a big injury still to this day. Um, but he, he just never really, never really no. recovered. But it was you a know. shame because I think he still had plenty of time left in him. And even, you know, if you look at um, the, you know, his, his international career as well, it was somewhat the same thing. He played his last uh, game for France, uh, I think, in 2013. You know, and look what France have gone on to achieve yeah. since then. It's because he had an attitude problem that, you know, was he going to play? Was he not? And um, yeah, I think he fell out with coaches and, you know, it I think what we're both saying is he kind of missed out. Yes, he had a good career, but you could have actually even had a better career. Would it have been as good as Zinedine Zidane's? Maybe not, but you will be mentioned in the same breath as him. Yeah. You, had, you had as much talent because you showed that, particularly Arsenal, you showed it at City in, in brief glimpses. Like You underachieved. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know a word to sum him up really other than underachieved because, again, he, he achieved stuff with us. He won titles and I, I still put him in the same bracket as Sanya, Kalishi and Torre. He was in teams that won us trophies. But it almost puts a damper on his on, on that whole ideology that he, he won us them because he could have achieved so much more and mm-hmm. it sort of gets you down thinking about it. he was a very good player um, and yeah he, he underachieved without a doubt I think that's the only word anybody any City fan can use to describe him um, yeah. but in, in his time at City he made 176 appearances scoring 27 goals which wasn't a bad return uh, he won two Premier League titles one League Cup and one Community Shield while in England. So, again, a good trophy haul for a midfielder. Um, for a midfielder who never won anything with Arsenal, I should, uh, should add. He won all them, all them trophies with City. Everything was with us, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I'm sure if, if he speaks about anything, City is deep within his heart with, with, uh, with those in his mind. Well, that's one for the, that's one for the pod. I, I would love to try and get a hold of him and you know and, and speak to him uh, about his time at, at, at City so yeah just um, I mean he won plenty of things but I think we were I think we were just under the we were blinking a little bit we thought we were getting the top Arsenal player to your point Dan because of the age that he was at he was coming into his prime and we we didn't see it we just saw it in flashes and that's a that's a real disappointment and for 25 million, that was nothing for the player we thought we were getting as well. Yeah. You know, so. But yeah, that, that was Sammy and Asri Blues. And uh, that's it for part two of Once a Blue episode four. Join us for part three, where me and City Day will be talking about Emmanuel Adibaitor and Premier League legend Patrick Vieira. <laughs>